welcome to the regular meeting. It is Wednesday, September 11th. Are we in compliance with open meeting laws? Yes, we are. Thank you very much. Please call the roll. Wyman. Here. Carlin. Here. DeWitt. Here. Herzog. Here. Hess. Here. Meltnik. Here. Right. Here. We have a quorum. I hope you will all join me in standing and saying the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence for all of our 9-11 Dr. Davis, will you please share the land acknowledgement? Uh, yes, as we gather today, I would like to acknowledge that in Oshkosh, we are on the ancestral homelands of the Ho-Chunk Nation and the Menominee Indian Tribe of Wisconsin who live along the western shores of Lake Winnebago, Wisconsin's largest freshwater lake entirely within its border. We acknowledge these indigenous sovereign communities uh, who have stewarded this land throughout the generations and pay respect to their elders past and present. We welcome the duty and opportunity to share stewardship of these lands. Thank you very much. And now the approval of the agenda. Is there anyone that would like to, Dr. Herzog? I had asked to pull uh, resolution 1A from the consent mm -hmm. resolution agenda to be voted on separately. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, motion to approve the new agenda. So, so moved. Oh, so moved. Who was the second? Who was the first? Carlin Wright. Call the roll. Carlin. Aye. DeWitt. Aye. Herzog. Aye. Yes. Aye. Smiltnik. Aye. Wright. Aye. Wyman. Aye. Motion carries. Uh, my, the board president's report. We were going to have our new student representatives from uh, Oshkosh North and Oshkosh West here this evening, but due to uh, the the meeting and coming to a new place, we decided that they will be at our next um, next meeting, and we welcome them to be representatives of all of the students of their respective schools. It's great to have their input, and we look forward to sharing our board information with them. Superintendent's report. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, active a uh, couple of weeks as we got to school going. Um, we're excited to see our youngest learners embark on their new education journey. Uh, they've been busy. Uh, they have been busy building their fine motor skills, language skills, and making connections with new friends, from exploring shapes and spatial reasoning uh, to being uh, creative, collaborative, and cooperative. Our 4K students are immersed in purposeful play um, and are off to a great start. Last week, we welcomed Governor Tony Evers to Jefferson Elementary School as part of our statewide back to school tour. Uh, during the visit, the governor had an opportunity to interact with students and staff. Um, he cheered on an exciting uh, a hoop Hop Showdown, a fun rock, paper, scissors, hula, hula hoop activity, uh, and gym class enjoyed a lively music session and chatted with fourth and fifth graders in their classroom. The governor uh, wrapped up his visit by joining Jefferson's youngest learners uh, for lunch in the cafeteria, where he had a chance to chat with kindergartners and acknowledge their efforts, and acknowledge the efforts of our dedicated food service staff. His visit was a wonderful opportunity to highlight the great work that's going on uh, at Jefferson Elementary and to celebrate the importance and impact of our public schools uh, in Oshkosh and across Wisconsin. So we thank the governor for, uh, for coming out. Oshkosh West students uh, in level one of the Academy for Global Studies program uh, have been able to uh, have an interactive and immersive experience uh, when learning about Plato's uh, allegory of the cave uh, in the English class in the Little Theater. Um, the students were encouraged to leave the cave uh, and share their learning uh, with the world. So uh, some great opportunities, uh, learning opportunities coming up uh, across the district. Um, today, students and staff um, from the Communities Program at Oshkosh North High School honored the memory of 9-11 by participating in a day of service. Uh, our students joined over 30 million other Americans in dedicating their time to help in the spirit of service, unity, and peace. Students worked at Winnebago County and the Oshkosh City Park Departments, uh, Christine Ann Center, Oshkosh uh, Humane Society, and Father Carr's Place to Be. 
By participating in this day of service, Oshkosh North students are not only giving back to their community, uh, but also learning valuable lessons about civic responsibility, empathy, and the power of collective action. I had the opportunity to join um, students in the uh, backwoods uh, to put a little mulch down at Oshkosh North, and I forgot how satisfying it is to see the pile of mulch just go down and down and down. So it was a great day, great day of work today, uh, and great to connect with the kids. So I appreciate them uh, having me out. Uh, also a reminder, um, we uh, have an invite out to the entire community uh, to join us on September 22nd for the public dedication and open house of our brand new Menominee Elementary School. Uh, the event will feature a brief dedication ceremony and self-guided tours, so please come out from 4 to 6 p.m. on Sunday, September 22nd. As mentioned at our last meeting, we're also hosting uh, community feedback sessions related to uh, our uh, potential upcoming referendum. Um, all are encouraged to please to, dis uh, to discuss our phase two of our four phase plan uh, and the potential of our April 2025 referendum. We have five evening sessions um, scheduled at locations throughout the district, uh, which you can see on the screen. And we're also going to be adding some new dates and times, including morning and afternoon times for people that can't make that 6.30 time. So those will be coming out shortly. Uh, we will continue to share updates as the dates get closer. Um, you can find all the details on our facilities website that's available at, uh, from our homepage. And finally, just a, a list of some of the places that I've been over the last couple of weeks. And again, just continue to appreciate everybody uh, being very welcoming and, and uh, um, helping us to have a really strong start to the school year. So, and that concludes the superintendent's good news report for tonight. Thank you very much. A budget variance update, Mr. Nihans. Good evening. So the budget variance report is for uh, data through August. It's obviously very light. We have two months in the fiscal year, so there's not a lot to put into the budget variance at this point. Everything uh, seems to be tracking fine, nothing out of the ordinary. Next month will be the month where we actually start getting a little bit more graphics and a little bit more um, of a ability to actually compare towards trend like what we're used to seeing. It's just really difficult with only two months and one month of that is really, really light spending in July. Any questions at all? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't believe we have any other reports tonight from uh, other committees. So we will get right to the heart of the matter. First of all, I want to thank everyone for being here this evening. It means a great deal that you are here giving input. We've received a lot of emails, we've received phone calls, and just your presence here tonight knows that we are involved in uh, the community. A few rules for tonight. Public comments will be limited to those who reside in the Oshkosh Area School District or have children attending the district. For safety purposes, people providing their public com comments will need to state the city they reside in and not their specific address. So when you're up here and you've already signed in, please clearly state your name and your community. And if you're acting as a spokesperson for a particular group of indi individuals, please indi indicate the group that you represent. Please state clearly and concisely the matters of your concern and limit your comments to three minutes. Remember that use of specific names of district personnel, titles, or identifiable descriptions may lead to legal liability. In such instances, please pursue the district's formal complaint process by contacting the superintendent's office at 920-424-0160 and they will direct you to the appropriate administrator. And in order that we stay civil tonight, we have a few more guidelines. We ask tonight that clapping, cheering, booing will not be allowed in this space to make sure that all citizens who speak can do so without judgment. If someone is in violation of these rules, I will give them one warning before they are removed. I will say, the person, I will say you are in violation of rules of civility you need to stop, and this is your warning. If the person continues, we will call for a recess. 
the board will walk off the stage and we will resume the meeting five minutes later after law enforcement is called in and takes care of the situation. At that time, there will be a break from all cameras and we will allow the officers to escort the person out of the meeting. Okay. Our first sign up, this is for non-agenda. We have one person and this is D Chance. And you can come right up to either one of the microphones, D. If that is possible. Or we can bring the microphone to you. Okay. This is non-agenda. Okay, great. Thank you. Very much. Okay. I'm getting a hip replacement. <laughs> All right. uh, so, uh, yes, uh, well, I felt that um, I, I had wanted to say something regarding uh, the last meeting uh, that we had an interruption. Uh, I was able to read the results in the newspaper about what had happened, and I just want to say that I absolutely support no book banning and free speech. Um, sometimes I think there's books that we may look at, but I respect the decision. Now. Uh, what I wanted to say is that in the spirit of that, I wanted to suggest a book to also add to the library, okay? This book is called Irreversible Damage, The Transgender Craze, Seducing Our Daughters by Abigail Schreier, okay? And the reason I think this is important is because, you know, I think we're doing a really good job with one side of the information, but we're not giving all the information. And while I know we're not in the business of giving out medical treatment, we are in the business of giving out information. And unfortunately, well not fortunately, I would say, is often the case in high schools and even middle schools that our young people are exploring their gender identity, okay? And um, what happens is sometimes they make a mistake, okay? And so where I'm going with this is, I should just tell you, I am a detransitioner. I had gender for me healthcare, and I'm not going to get a lot of my story, but I will tell you that a mistake was made, okay? And I'm now permanently damaged because of that, okay? And the thing about it is that, you know, in our detransitioner group online, we have 55,000 people on it, okay, 55,000. And many of these young people are young girls 18 years old, okay? Which means they started transitioning when they were in high school. Okay. And so I'm not saying that, you know, we want to remove information, but I'm saying we want to add information, okay? So people have the best, uh, you know, information to make the best choices with themselves and their families, okay? So that's where I'm coming from. Definitely not to disparage anybody else's experience, but I think, you know, this is definitely a valid experience, you know, detransition is happening to our young people way too much, especially the girls, okay? And it's heartbreaking read their stories. And so, you know, and again, the magnitude, 55,000, that's almost the entire population of Oshkosh. Think about it. If the entire population of Oshkosh was told they were transgender, went through medical treatment only to find out they weren't. So that's where I'm coming from. I also would like to compile a list of books I could also suggest and I even saw a special thing. We could bring in detransitioners to the school assembly to hear their stories. They're inspiring stories of recovery. <clears throat> I think that would be a, a really good balance thing. I yield the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That is the only one that we have for non-agenda. Next is agenda-related public forum, and we have no one signed up for non-Title IX agenda items. Moving on to speaking in support of Title IX updates. A total of 30 minutes during the meeting will be allotted for agenda-related public forum for people speaking in support of Title IX updates. Each speaker will be allowed up to three minutes to speak. Public comments, again, will be limited to those who reside in the Oshkosh Area School District or have children attending the district. For safety purposes, please provide the public comments. We'll need to share their city they reside in and not their specific address. First one is Amanda 
Cramp. Hello, my name is Amanda Cramp, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm an Oshkosh resident as well as the parent of two OASD students. I'm sure you all recognize this, it's the 2024 to 2025 Family Guidebook for the Oshkosh Area School District. This guidebook contains many of the policies and codes of conduct for students, families, and community members. I would like to share some of these policies with you. From page eight, the OASD core values are engaged students and staff, integrity, excellence, responsive improvement, safe learning and working environment, collaborative culture. The OASD vision is we will be the leader in education through innovation while focusing on the whole child. The OASD mission is we will enrich our community by supporting our students to lead creative and empowered lives. The OASD guiding principle is students first. Is failing to comply with the new Title IX regulations putting students first? Is it providing a safe learning and working environment for all students, including trans and queer kids? A focus on the whole child indicates that the district wants to support a child's whole self, which includes gender identity and sexuality. From page 21, referencing board policy 5350, the board recognizes that suicide is a leading cause of death among youth and must be taken seriously. The Trevor Project's 2023 U.S. National Survey on the Mental Health of LGBTQ Young People found that roughly half of trans and non-binary youth have considered attempting suicide. LGBTQ youth are four times more likely to attempt suicide than their peers. If the board takes youth suicide seriously, you must continue to protect queer and trans students by passing the new Title IX regulations. I also looked at the student handbook for Oshkosh West, the school we are in right now. Students are expected to follow the wildcat way, which includes respect, speak and act with kindness towards others, and safety, create an environment where all students feel accepted in the school. We expect our students, who are children, to act kindly and with empathy towards others. They are disciplined if they do not follow these codes of conduct. Failing to pass the new Title IX regulations tells OSD students that kindness and acceptance are not valued in their schools. I thought we wanted to raise leaders and good people who respect their peers. Do not cave to homophobic and transphobic threats. My husband Andrew, who can't be here tonight because he's at home caring for our children, wanted me to re relay this to you. Quote, Every single board member voting against this funding will tell us all today that their resentful hatred is more important than $5.5 million of funding for our children's education. We can't afford your bigotry, and may someone have mercy on your souls because I certainly wouldn't. Vote yes on the updated Title IX regulations if you truly care about our students. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jean Erdman. My name is Jean Erdman and I live in Oshkosh. <laughs> Voting yes on Title IX expansion means all have access to all opportunities. Is it comfortable to be not denied what others get? No. Can you give your all when you feel stepped on? No. Can you learn your best when you are denied access? No. Title IX means all having access to everything. If you do your best when you have full opportunities to participate and are welcomed into the group, then vote yes on the Title IX expansion. If you do your best without harassment, endangerment, or exclusion, then vote yes on supporting the expansion of the federal Title IX. Be a good steward of the district's federal money and live up to the district motto, students first, all students first not subsets of parents, not adults sidetracked side by out-of-state funders, but students first, all students first. Title IX, vote yes. We live in a time when billionaires are involved in politics at the local level, and we find neighbor fighting neighbor. We are being encouraged to disrespect educators. I love the Oshkosh Public Schools. I think it's time to stop the disrespect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. P.J. Hobbs. <clears throat> my name is T.J. Hobbs. My pronouns are they, them. I live in Oshkosh, and I am co-executive director and co-founder of Oshkosh Pride. 
my heart goes out tonight to every trans person and every LGBTQ plus person who has had to listen to our elected leaders discussing and eventually voting on whether or not they are equal persons worthy of equal protections. They are worthy, this isn't even a question. The majority of my statement tonight is going to be me reading several quotes from Monday, September 9th, 2024 press release, Fair Wisconsin and GSAFE file federal complaint detailing hostile environment fostered by school board Complaint filed on behalf of trans and non-binary students in Kettle Marine School District. Fair Wisconsin and GSAFE today filed a joint complaint to the Office for Civil Rights at the United States Department of Education in support of trans and non-binary students, educators, staff, and families in schools at the Kettle Marine School District. The complaint details how the elected school board of the district fostered a hostile environment in violation of Title IX requirements, excuse me, regulations. Creating a hostile environment for trans and non-binary kids creates a hostile environment for every kid. Our children are watching, and when elected school board members <sighs> weaponize the identity of some of our most vulnerable children, we must take action to stop them. We, Fair Wisconsin and GSAFE, know school boards in other districts may be making similar actions, making anti-trans statements during formal board meetings, refusing to act on discrimination, and even casting votes against Title IX and the inclusion of protections based on gender identity. These districts and other outside organizations are actively spreading disinformation about out-of-state litigation to deter LGBTQ plus youth from exercising their rights. Let me be clear, we are watching and as we learn more, we will file more complaints on behalf of the students in those districts, end quote. In closing, I'd like to remind the board, you have a duty as elected officials to strengthen and ensure anti-discrimination protections for all students and staff, to certify our district's compliance with federal law, and to make responsible financial decisions on behalf of taxpayers. Failure to comply with the Title IX amendments means our district will be forfeiting millions in school funding. It will immediately open up our district to expensive and extensive discrimination lawsuits and federal complaints, and it will still be illegal in Wisconsin, and it will be against our district's equity plan, and it will be against our district's policies 2260, 2266, and 5517 to discriminate against any trans students or non-binary students at any of our district's schools. On behalf of all students in our district and the people who love them, I'm asking you to please do the ethical thing tonight. Please do the responsible thing tonight, and please do the legal thing tonight. Please vote yes on Title IX tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Amber Gilbertson. Hi, I am Amber Gilbertson. I'm a resident of Oshkosh, Wisconsin. I am an alumni of OAS, and I am a parent of an OAS student. Um, bullying and harassment has been a huge issue in our school district. As a student, I was bullied much of my school career from kindergarten up and I have watched now as my child was bullied and I've watched as friends and others have been bullied and as a parent it is heartbreaking to watch your child crying because they're different for whatever reason no parent should have to watch their child struggle in a place that they're supposed to be growing and flourishing. Our students deserve better. Our students need this in place. Please vote yes. Thank you. Thank you. Holly Poopart. Did I pronounce that okay, Holly? Yes. Thank you. Buju Gokinawia, Jambo, Nyajong, Assalamu Alaikum, Privich, Muraho. These are the languages that uh, myself and other educators at Head, Head Start here all over the Fox Valley and all over the country have had the honor of hearing. And these families are the future you know, students starting from the little age of three all the way up until high school. I got to meet 30 families. And uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Holly Poopart. I am an Oshkosh resident. 
I am an OSAD graduate, and uh, I am a mom and an auntie to children here in the district. And I'm also an early childhood educator and a mandated reporter with national and state level completed background checks. Just wanted to make that noted for anybody who claims that I am or other educators like me are a risk to children. Anyways, now my experience at uh, these Head Start welcome visits are, have been overwhelmingly beautiful, welcoming, generous, and diverse and extremely, extremely, educa extremely educational, sorry. So Title IX protects these families from all over, both residents here who were born here and from all over. Oshkosh is actually known for being one of the welcoming homes to some of the same oppressive forces, for, uh, sorry, oppressive forces that brought them here to Oshkosh in the for first place. And I've seen firsthand from the time that I can, I, I found my family here up until, you know, struggling each day, I have found that, uh, that there are positive impacts to these Title IX, you know, amendments, and I only want to see them flourish. I only want to see and continue to watch my littles and the students that I love grow each and every day. Now, these updates, now will help them, support them even more. And I know that by voting yes, that we will truly, truly create and actually get the, you know, the city that we know that we love and the, the Oshkosh that I grew up in and that I have been so blessed to see expand. So thank you. Thank you. Carrie Tetzloff. I'm Carrie Tetzloff, a graduate of OASD and a community member that deeply worries about the safety of LGBTQ plus community members of all ages. I urge our board to adopt the 2024 Title IX amendments according to an analysis of the LGBTQ plus data in the Youth Risk Behavior Survey that was administered in 2021. Only two thirds of Wisconsin trans youth reported feeling safety at school and 18% reported skipping school in the past year due to feeling unsafe there. When any of our students feel unsafe, our schools are unsafe. My understanding is the Appleton Area School District adopted the Title IX amendments regardless of the injunction and one of their schools being listed on the Moms for Liberty school list associated with the Kansas lawsuit. While there are injunctions preventing federal enforcement of the new regulations in certain schools, Due to this lawsuit, my understanding is these injunctions extend only to specific schools, not other schools in the district. I'm not an attorney, I can't give any legal advice, but I can share as a community member how it has felt to watch this debate rage online and offline in Oshkosh these past several weeks. I have witnessed a horrific degree of bullying and threatening online behavior directed towards community members who have spoken up in defense of LGBTQ members of our community. If that is any reflection of what students might encounter at school, I think we should all be deeply worried and should understand why the newly expanded definitions of sex-based discrimination and harassment are sorely needed. A few provisions of Title IX that I feel belong in our district anti-discrimination policies regardless of a federal mandate, some of which are already there, um, provide full protection from sex-based harassment, prohibit discrimination against LGBTQ Plus, students, employees, and others require schools to take prompt and effective action to end any sex discrimination in their education programs or activities and to prevent its recurrence and remedy its effects. Require schools to provide supportive measures to complainants and respondents affected by conduct that may constitute sex discrimination, including sexual violence and other forms of sex-based harassment. Require schools to respond promptly and effectively to all complaints of sex discrimination with fair, transparent, and reliable processes. Our students deserve these protections, and I hope to see our OASD board vote to accept these provisions in our district. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mallory Schneider Birschbach.
Good evening. My name is Mallory Schneider Birschbach, pronouns she, her, and I reside in the city of Oshkosh. I am a cisgender, heterosexual woman. I am a mother to a child in OASD. I fully support the updates to Title IX. These updates strengthen protections for everyone in the district. Some of the outcry I've heard from people in this community is based in fear, transphobia, hate, and straight up lies. Children existing as their authentic selves is not a threat to other students or to so-called parental rights. We must not pander to individuals or extremist groups that are using kids as scapegoats. Remember, we're talking about children. Other, othering and demonizing children based on sex and gender is problematic and exactly the reason why updates to Title IX are necessary. Human biology is not as simple as XX and XY. It is estimated that one or two in 100 people born in the US alone are intersex. For example, people born with androgen insensitivity syndrome are genetically male. They both have X and Y chromosome, but are born with all or some of the physical traits of a female. People are also born with only one sex chromosome or more than the typical two. You cannot always identify these variations on external features alone. Gender identity and expression are not binaries either. People, including children, should be allowed to be who they are without fear of discrimination and harassment. Again, we're talking about children. Let's be very clear. Affirmation of people's existence is not enforcement of a specific ideology. Sadly, topics such as Title IX have led to a wave of threats and bullying in this community. We cannot allow threats and bullying of our students, especially by adults. These bullies are doing the opposite of protecting children. We must not compromise with hate. We must protect our community and students against hate. Please vote in support of these Title IX updates. Thank you. Thank you. Shelley Mikulski. Hi, Shelley Mikulski, City of Oshkosh. Um, modern scientific research shows that the kids that went through the COVID pandemic are struggling with higher levels of depression, anxiety, and hopelessness than any other generation in history. Um, I think it's only right to support the Title IX initiative. Um, and just to be brief, as Ms. Harris said last night, there's a lot more that holds us together than keeps us apart. And I think that is a big message for children coming up through schools who need to know that they are seen, they are heard, and they are honored. Probably all of us have been touched by suicide. Suicide of a friend, a relative, or maybe just someone you know. Both the Herald and the Northwestern have written nice pieces on suicide here in the Fox Valley and suicides of minors in the Fox Valley. What is going to happen when a child who is perceived as different is ostracized or allowed to be bullied? Uh, it doesn't take rocket science to figure that out. They are going to spiral into possible addiction problems and suicide. Uh, please, I think every person in this room is here for the good of the kids. So let's vote for them. Thank you. Joyce Frau? Pro. Pro. Thank you. <laughs> Joyce Frone, uh, resident of Oshkosh, parent of a daughter who graduated from Oshkosh North High. And she can't be here because she's at work, but she gave me a message. She said, why don't we just tell people to not discriminate against, not harass, and not hurt anybody? Whether you're trans or 
a football player, or you got purple hair, or you're the last girl in your class to get her period. Maybe we should just say no. We shouldn't harass them. We shouldn't discriminate against them. We shouldn't tell them they're a bad person. How about that? Also, for anybody who says, oh my goodness, biological boys could compete with girls. Um, she also said this. She was in wrestling in grade school with boys. As a first grader, she wrestled down a fifth grade boy. So, uh, you know, maybe some of us can compete. Thank you. Chris Carnes. <coughs> Going once, going twice. I'm reading this properly, aren't I? Yes, I believe so. Okay. Uh, Nicole Poliak. <coughs> Hello, I am Nicole. My pronoun is our. <laughs> Hello, I am Nicole Poliak. My pronouns are she, they. I am from Oshkosh, and I am an alumni of the Oshkosh Area School District. It is your responsibility to adopt Title IX and to protect trans and queer kids from discrimination. I know from personal experience, I was a, <laughs> I knew I was trans when I was in fourth grade. I had the words to describe who I was even at that age. But in this district, I never felt like I had the safety to express it. I knew I didn't have the safety to because I was already bullied in this school district without even coming out as trans until my final year of high school. I felt forced to hide who I was and shove it down, which led me to self-harm suicide, and suicidal thoughts that sent me to the hospital during my time in this district two times. This lack of safety to be who you are is not something any child should have to go through. It is your responsibility to protect all children in the district. This includes trans, non-binary, and queer children. Vote in favor of Title IX. Thank you. Thank you. Maria Boucher. My name is Maria Boucher. Um, I live in Oshkosh, and I'm a parent of um, uh, one child in first grade. Um, I'm reading tonight from uh, mostly from the uh, GLSEN climate survey, which is um, it's the leading national education organization focused on ensuring safe schools for all students. I'm going to read um, some of the results from the survey. Um, findings from the GLSEN 2021 National School Climate Survey demonstrate that Wisconsin schools were not safe for most LGBTQ plus secondary school students. In addition, many LGBTQ plus students in Wisconsin did not have access to important school supports. Of note, the 2020 and 2021 school year was unique in that the COVID-19 pandemic caused disruption to schools across the country as schools had to adapt in the wake of the pandemic, drastically changing how many students experienced school. In Wisconsin, 12% of LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus students attended school only in person, 21% attended only online, and 66% attended school in hybrid settings. The vast majority, so these are the, some of the results, the vast majority of LGBTQ students in Wisconsin regularly sometimes, often, or frequently, heard anti-LGBTQ plus remarks. Many also regularly, regularly heard school staff make homophobic remarks, 52%, and 
and negative remarks about someone's gender expression, 70%. Most LGBTQ plus students in Wisconsin experienced anti-LGBTQ plus victimization at school. They also experienced victimization at school based on religion, 25% disability, 29%, and race, ethnicity, 16%. Most never reported the incident to school staff, 58%, because they didn't feel safe. And those who had, only 24% 24 of LGBTQ students said that it resulted in effective staff intervention. Many LGBTQ students in Wisconsin reported discriminatory policies or practices at their school. More than one in two, 52%, experienced at least one form of anti-LGBTQ plus discrimination at school. Due to time, I'm not going to read the rest, but um, th this is ridiculous and not okay. Um, I encourage you to vote yes for the pr protections for Title IX. Thank you very much. Alan Schulke. Hello, my name is Alan Schelke. My pronouns are he, him, and I work, volunteer, and reside here in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Oshkosh has been my home for the majority of my life, and I'm so blessed and privileged to have been educated here through the Oshkosh Area School District. The extended provisions and protections in Title IX must be approved. The damages that can and will occur should the Oshkosh Area School District vote against Title IX and go against federal law, the damages would be substantial. Not only would the entire district be at risk of losing millions of federal funding, opting to go against these protections puts all of our children at risk. In my own humble opinion, this school district would have benefited from Title IX and now its new protect protections uh, decades ago. Trans and queer children have always been here and they always will be. Please vote yes for Title IX. All of our children are depending on you all up on that stage to make the correct and wise decision today and protect queer and trans children. I beg you all to vote yes for the Title IX provisions and protections. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and our final speaker will be Jennifer Considine. Good evening, my name is Jennifer Constantine. I'm from Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Uh, my husband and I have two children who currently uh, attend school here in Oshkosh, one in middle school and one in high school. I'm here tonight um, to encourage you to vote yes on Title IX to protect youth against harassment in our schools. I wanna share um, a little bit about how I've been feeling this last week and then I wanna share some statistics. So first I wanna share how I've been feeling. And a lot in the last week I've been really sad to see really important and really valued members of our community who are targeted with harassment in very public ways. And that's not okay, right? I actually, before I came here tonight, I took my dog for a walk and I happened to live by the downtown Y and I walked by um, where the kids were outside playing on the playground. And one kid who looked at about three turned to another kid and said, I don't appreciate that. I don't even know what the other kid had said to them. And he said, I think you should be kind. And the kid looked back and he said, I'm sorry, and they had a hug. And I thought, oh my gosh, how much could we learn from kids, right? Like, we need to be kind. We need to show each other love. And we need to do that for so many reasons, but let me give you a couple of statistics. Um, in the 2023 Wisconsin Youth Risk Behavior Survey, 21.6% of students reported being bullied on school property, and 17.8% of students reported being bullied electronically. The idea that we have to investigate harassment that occurs off school grounds is not without grounds. There's so much electronic harassment that happens, the school should be responsible for investigating that kind of harassment. 
There's also a notable gap in rates of bullying. 31% of female students report experiencing bullying and 22% of males. LGBTQ, LGBTQ students report bullying at much higher rates with 43% of students reported bullying compared to 22% of heterosexual students. Um, someone earlier read some results from the National School Climate Survey um, done by GLSEN of students in Wisconsin. I'm gonna share two more things. 52% um, of students never reported the harassment that they experienced. And while most of those students could identify at least one school staff member supportive of LGBTQ plus students, uh, less than half could identify more than six. You have the opportunity tonight to be seven people in the Oshkosh Area School District that students can come to when they experience harassment and bullying. Before I wrap up, I wanna share one more statistic. When the federal government developed these Title IX regulations, they took years. They got comments from tens of thousands of students, teachers, parents, lawyers, legislatures, and then they released the recommendations and they got 240,000 public comments. And they revised and they came up with the best practices to protect the students that are in our schools. You have the opportunity tonight to say yes to Title IX and I ask you to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, now we'll be moving on to the agenda-related public forum, speaking not in support of Title IX updates. Our first speaker is Shane Urban. My name is Shane Urban. Uh, I reside in Oshkosh. I have two kids who are also in the Oshkosh School District. Title IX was originally created to protect girls and women in sports and education. This new policy and regulation is 1,500 pages long and sweeps over many things that aren't what Title IX was created for. I'm asking that the board vote no to the Title IX policy and see what happens. If everyone votes yes only for the fear of losing funding, I say look at other districts that have voted no and you will see that other districts are not losing funding if it's not adopted. Even our own attor attorney said we'd unlikely lose funding if we do not adopt the new Title IX regulations. Adopting this new law requires a coordinator. We already hired a DEI coordinator in the district. Another coordinator is not what is needed in the Oshkosh Area School District. Oshkosh Area School District needs more funding for higher paid teachers who teach our wonderful students, take those funds that would be used for a Title IX coordinator, and instead use those funds to hire awesome teachers. Congress writes and changes laws. School boards should not be the ones deciding what this law means. There's too much confusion over the law. If we don't know what it means, then vote no. Under the law, if my sons are in a male locker room at school and a female who identifies as a male walks into their locker room and starts undressing, my kids feel uncomfortable with this, then they're going to be the ones asked to leave the locker room. No, they are in the right locker room. And no, uh, yeah, they are, they're in, the, they're in the right locker room and no, and they, they can be the ones to get into trouble. This way of thinking is strange and preposterous. Many of the things covered in our Title IX are things we already are doing in our schools. Our school district is very welcoming to all students. We have great teachers and school staff that are very welcoming to all students who come to school. They give selflessly, they go above and beyond daily to make our schools safe spaces for all students who are in our schools. We don't need Title IX to accomplish this in the Oshkosh Area School District. A thing that was meant to help and to be inclusive could morph into something that is destructive and hurtful for our students. By voting yes, we're opening ourselves up to more litigation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Rocky Rodriguez. Good evening, board. My name is Rocky Rodriguez. I am with the organization Gays Against Groomers. I am the, cha the state co-chapter leader. And I'm here to talk about keeping Title IX in its original form. Title IX in its part in original form was enacted as a part of an education Point of amendment. Order. Are you an Oshkosh resident? Yes, I am. Cumberland Thank you. Court Apartments. Is that okay? Can yep. I? Thank you. Wanna? you. All right. Title IX was enacted as a part of the Education Amendment of 1972 and has been a cornerstone in promoting equality in education for over four decades. 
Its impact on our schools, colleges, and universities has been profound and far-reaching. First and foremost, Title IX has been instrumental in ensuring that all students have access to educational opportunities. The legislation has opened doors for countless young women, allowing them to pursue academic and athletic endeavors that were once out of reach. By maintaining Title IX, we continue to uphold the principle that every student deserves a fair chance to succeed. Moreover, Title IX has played a critical role in addressing and preventing sexual harassment and assault in educational institutions. It provides a framework for schools to respond to such incidents, ensuring that victims receive the support they need and that perpetrators are held accountable. Weakening Title IX would undermine these protections and could lead to an unsafe learning environment for all of these students. However, given the current administration's rewrite to Title IX, we now have bad actors who are abusing and taking advantage of the Title IX rule update to enter any restroom, any locker room, go into any sports team that best identifies with how they feel. This is not only wrong, but it is also a safety concern and liability to the schools and the taxpayers. Fictitious pronouns and plural pronouns of a singular person is compelled speech. What else will educators who bend the knee to the cult of gender ideology compel children to do while their parents are away? Title IX is more than just a law. It is a promise to these students that it, their safety and dignity will be protected. I urge you to support continued enforcement of the original Title IX, ensuring that our schools remain a place of safety, opportunity, and keeping males out of girls' locker rooms and girls out of males' locker rooms. I wouldn't be afraid of these threats. There has never been a school that has lost funding from not a adapting the new Title IX revision. You already have everything and you only need certain requirements to meet and I'm pretty sure your school already does that otherwise you'd already be in violation. I'm standing here as a gay man to tell you that what you're agreeing to is actually having an effect not only on your school district, your student count, but also actual gays and lesbians. Your decisions are hurting more than just your students you have a small population of these self-ID'd people who feel a certain way. And the only common thread that I find at all of these speeches and all these board meetings is depression, anxiety, and mental health. I think that is what everybody should worry about other than this gender ideology nonsense because it's not helping anybody anywhere. So have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Richard Ives. should never get to me. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Richard Ives. I'm a 70-year resident of Oshkosh. I'm here this evening to bring a voice of reason, truth, and common sense, which is fast becoming an uncommon commodity. Our, so our society, which was built solidly, solidly on the Judeo-Christian ethic, is under attack. It is being intentionally dismantled. The foundations of our country are being simultaneously and systematically destroyed with much success chaos and confusion are what follow closely behind. A small group of sexually confused people are insisting on some things which are diametrically opposed to reason, truth, and common sense, and the safety and well-being of our children, grandchildren, and our society at large. Two main issues are at hand. Number one, should biological males be allowed to use the bathrooms, locker rooms, and showers of female students? The reasonable and common sense response is a resounding no. 99.9% .9 of female students should never be forced into sexually explicit situations with males. A biological male can and will never be anything but a male, no matter how many drugs are pumped into his body and no matter how many surgical mutilations are performed on his body. Do some genetic testing on any sexually confused person and the result will be the same every time. A male remains a genetic male and a female remains a genetic female. The real issue is males wanting to get in with the females. Sexual deviancy, perversion, immorality, and fornication are the only results. None are good. Do not vote for this perversion of Title IX. Now, a little humor here on pronouns. Hello, my name is blah, blah, blah. My pronouns are supercalifragilisticexpialidocious and ishkiddlyopenbopenbobobendidendotenwadotenshh, at least today. If you don't use my chosen pronouns, you will offend me, and I will see to it that you are arrested, fined, and imprisoned, you bigot. Ridiculous. Ludicrous, you say. Exactly. Did you get the point? No one should be forced to learn, as it were, a foreign language. Imagine the confusion of a teacher in a classroom with 25 to 30 students, all with different sets of pronouns, which may change from day to day. Reason and common sense demand that only he, his, and she, her be used. That and only that is what is right. 
Society is being forced to lose its collective mind. Don't lose ish uh, don't lose yours. Vote no on this gross perversion of Title IX. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Christy Jansen. Hi, my name is Christy Jansen and I live in Oshkosh. Recently, the director of Oshkosh Pride stated, you don't get to impose those beliefs on anyone else, but isn't that exactly what is happening here? Isn't this policy imposing a belief system that most of us do not agree with? It will force, it will force the majority to conform to the demands of a small minority, all at the expenses of our children's safety and education. This is a policy that is blatantly unjust and deeply biased. Our children are being thrown under the bus to appease a small vocal group. Their rights, their safety, and their well-being are continuously getting ignored, plain and simple. This is not equality. This is an appeasement at the extent of fairness. Look at what is happening at North. Students are using their identities to engage in inappropriate sexual activities in the bathrooms. Is this what we want? Is, if this policy goes through, we risk serious legal issues, including but not limited to pregnancies and rape claims. The legal complications can quickly escalate. Is this the direction we want to head? What does this mean for teachers and students? One wrong pronoun or mistake could destroy careers and futures, even lead to suicide. This isn't just a policy, it's a legal and educational mess. Schools should focus on education, not the confusion and disruption of this policy will bring, pulling, pulling students away from what truly matters, learning and graduation. The American Psychological Association notes that the transgender individuals experience higher rates of depression and anxiety, which elevate their risk of suicide. Suicide among transgender people is typically the result of multiple factors, not solely to bullying. The prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain responsible for the decision-making and regula regulating behavior, doesn't fully develop until f the age of 25. Children, especially under 18, lack the cognitive maturity to make life-altering decisions about their identities. Research shows that over 80% of children who experience gender dysphoria will eventually grow out of it by adulthood. And what about the growing number of individuals who began transitioning as minors but later regretted their decision? A survey from last year revealed that 40% of those who detransitioned believe their dysphoria was linked to a mental health condition, and 62% felt that the medical professionals failed to fully explore whether trauma influenced their decision. 21 states have already fought back and secured injunctions against this regulation, including Texas, Missouri, and Florida. If you allow this policy to go forward, you will see a decline in student attendance. Parents like me will not stand by while our children's future are put at risk. We will fight for the statute forcing school attendance to be removed and we will demand that our tax dollars stop supporting a system that refuses to protect all students. This isn't just about gender identity, it's about protecting the future of our children. Deny this expansion of Title IX, stop adding confusion to gender dysphoria and protect all of our students. It's time to stand up and say no. It would be nice if we could go back and do a reset, slow down on these issues, like instead of bringing pornographic books, we go back to basics such as see spot run. Thank you. We lost our signal. We'll be back up in a minute. Are both of the screens out, the BenQ? The two, the, the two on the, the two but the two, the one farther out are still on. Can you see those? Okay. Yes. Can you see that? So that would be the one that would be that. I'll just move over and then I'll be able to see it. Oh, wait, never mind. Oh, that one's out. Sorry. That one's out too. They're doing a quick reset. They're resetting. Thank you for your patience. Can now see the timer on that CD. Mm -hmm. For real. Oh, yeah. And that one. That's okay. I can just move my chair over here and we can continue. Okay. Katie Campbell.
Hello. Thank you so much for allowing us to have this discourse tonight. Um, this is really important for our community to hear both sides of an argument and have a civil debate. Um, Point of order. I'm really sorry, but I didn't hear you announce your name or your residence, if you live in Oshkosh. I do live in Oshkosh. My name was announced. Do I really need to announce it again? Katie Campbell. It's Katie Campbell. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. These amendments, the biggest concern for me, I believe it's found on uh, page 33,819, has to do with some of the um, processes that are involved with allowing individuals into private spaces such as a bathroom or a locker room, specifically getting rid of um, parental consent or involving any parental consent, um, and also the specific period of time that is currently in place for um, transgender individuals to not only declare, um, have that relationship or that um, being known in the school system with their teachers, um, that is also completely wiped out and it sounds like it's just a form that is basically filled out by this in the individual student that they just sign and then they are allowed to go into these private spaces. Um, I did some basic research just online, and the CDC indicates that sexual assault rates are, have gone up by 3% since, I believe, 2017 um, to 2021 specifically, from 15% to, I believe, 18%, um, especially, obviously, with females. That is also extremely, extremely concerning. As an individual who suffered from sexual assault in public school, I am pleading with you to please consider these children. Especially these children that do not have a choice to go to a private school or to be homeschooled. Their parents both have to work. They do not qualify for a voucher school. After months and months of enduring abuse, I finally was able to come forward and bring what was happening to me to a teacher. I don't know if that is happening with these students here today, especially with all the bullying that has been mentioned. Please, please consider putting a pause to this. I do not know the ins and outs of what it means to say no today. I don't know if you can just put a pause on it, maybe bring it forward again with some amendments, something that can maybe appease both sides in some way, but please protect all children in this district. Thank you. Thank you. D. Chance. Uh, thank you. Uh, D. Chance, Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Um, well, first of all, uh, the first thing I want to say that I'm very sensitive to bullying, so I can appreciate what people are saying. I'm often bullied because I'm a detransitioner. Can you believe that? People actually try to silence my voice, in fact. And while I'm very sensitive to it, I don't necessarily think that uh, adding Title IX legislation is going to take care of hate and bullying. To me, you know, I'm not saying I, I don't think those are issues. Please understand that. To me, this is a safety issue, you know. I think if we have males and females together in sports and changing rooms, the issue is not if a girl would get hurt, it'd be when. It's gonna happen. Because it's happening all across the country. We, we see stories, you know, and, and I, I think that, that uh, you know, that would uh, open up uh, just a, I don't know, what do they call it, a boar's nest, a bee's nest, <laughs> of problems, you know what I'm saying? Um, and so that's that. Um, what else I want to say here? Okay. Um, <coughs> oh, yes. I also think this would uh, send a terrible message to women and girls in the community. It is not fair to take away the rights of one group of people in the name of another. So we can't take girls' rights away. That would be wrong and unfair. You know, everybody is for inclusion. I know that. I know that from the community. I hear it. That's what people want. But I think we all need to come together and think of other inclusion solutions that do not infringe on the rights and safety of the girls of the school. 
And so for that reason, I think we have a lot of work to do. Um, as I said, you know, working on new inclusion solutions. And, um, you know, so, you know, we make the school positive for everybody. Um, you know, and again, you know, I don't think this is about bullying and hate. I don't think that you can legislate that away. You know, unfortunately, people are like that. I, it, I get it all the time. I'm also a lesbian, you know, and um, I don't know why people can be so mean to one another. You know, it's sad to me. And as I said, I often get a lot of bullying for being a detransitioner, for speaking my voice, for telling my story about what happened to me. Okay, so for that reason, I would absolutely suggest that you absolutely consider voting no on this proposal. Thank you. I Thank yield you. the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Scott. My name is Bill Scott and I am an Oshkosh resident and I've got three grandkids that we are taking care of in the Oshkosh schools. And most of what I wanted to say has already been said, but I am worried and, uh, and concerned about my granddaughter. She's in uh, elementary school being put in, uh, being in a, in a restroom where uh, biological males have access to and uh, I don't like it. I don't like the fact that her safety and her feeling of safety is taken away. The Oshkosh schools have done a tremendous amount of safety, 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 always safety, and that's good. Uh, you can't go up a slide backwards. It's not safe. You can't run in the halls. It's not safe. But yet we're opening up our, we want to open up our uh, restroom, restrooms and uh, locker rooms. Uh, and mix biological males with biological females. I don't like it. I hope that you, uh, as one person said, will we'll get together and maybe come up with something that will uh, satisfy everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Jared Longsign, Long Scene. All right, I think I win the award for tallest. I'm Jared Longsign. I am from uh, Oshkosh. Uh, I have worked and lived in this uh, district most of my life. I'm, I serve as a pastor in the Oshkosh area where many of our children attend public schools right here. In recent years, our nation has experienced a shift in social norms. Whether one views these changes as positive or negative, opinions greatly vary. From my perspective, some of these shifts are an attack on religious liberties. In 2018, the Masterpiece Cake Shop case concluded that a cake maker could not refuse to create a cake for a same-sex couple based on the owner's religious beliefs. The Supreme Court viewed this as one civil right, anti-discrimination, versus another civil right, the free exercise of religion. In 2023, the 303 Creative case held that a Christian website designer was not obligated to create a website for same-sex weddings. The case involved compelling speech in the creation of a website, and the court saw this as one civil right, anti-discrimination, versus two civil rights, the free exercise of religion and the freedom of speech. This is where they drew the line. The First, the first Amendment, as the court explained, protects individuals' right to speak his mind, even if others find that speech deeply misguided, or it causes anguish. The First Amendment also generally protects individuals from being compelled by the government to, to voice a particular message. Recent updates to this title have lowered the standards for harassment to include, among other things, not using someone's preferred pronouns uh, as a basis for sex-based harassment. This is the critical point. These updates violate the sincerely held religious beliefs of some individuals. The compulsions of such speech would violate the First Amendment just as in the 303 creative case. This presents one civil right versus two civil rights. There are many sides to any ruling, but I want to leave you with a few thoughts. Schools already have a place, should already have rules in place for non-discrimination, for anti-bullying, 
And I trust that they're making every effort to make sure that no student, whether Christian or Muslim, Jewish, straight, LGBTQ, white, or a person of color, experiences bullying or harassment. The second point is in trying to fix one problem, let's be careful not to create another one. A Christian student should have the same freedom of speech, the same freedom of religion belief as everyone else. These updates could potentially marginalize that student who hold different perspectives. Finally, I am called to treat people as a Christian with respect, love, and compassion, even if I disagree with how they choose to live their lives. I hope others will extend that same courtesy to me. I respectfully ask you to vote no on the expanded Title IX rules. Let us continue doing what we've always done. Treat people with respect, love, and compassion while allowing our students to receive an education without fear of having their firmly held religious beliefs and constitutional rights infringed upon. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you. Matt Took. You're killing me, Jared. Holy. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> my name is Matthew Took, I'm from Oshkosh. Uh, thanks everybody for being here tonight, I really appreciate it. I think we can all agree uh, bullying is wrong and we need to stand up against that no matter who and what side it's on. Um, from my analysis of this, it looks like when you compare the Title IX to the existing guidance or the policies that we have in place, we lose two things. We lose parental notification can you imagine a time where a child would need their parents more than when they're questioning their own gender? So that would strip that away. It also strips away a test that um, was talked about when I went to the listening session where an individual has to have a long-standing belief that they are another gender. This would strip that away and they could simply choose um, what they wanted to be that day. So, um, you know, it's important to speak truth in charity and love. And so I want everybody to know here that I have love for everybody here. My question is, don't we have an obligation to protect and balance all boys and girls' rights? Um, I believe Title IX is a case where you're giving one group a privilege that infringes upon another. Um, we're all familiar with the Establishment Clause, where Congress can't make a law establishing a state-run religion. The idea being you can't have a state-run religion and then also uphold the laws of, or the rights of everybody else. The two don't go together. Rights are, that are granted to one group cannot supersede the rights of another. Don't we owe it to our boys and girls to give the rights out in a balanced manner. Forcing children to undress or use a bathroom with a member of the opposite sex it's not, is not inclusive. It violates boys and girls' natural inclinations, their comfort, their security on, a, on the deepest level. Not to mention it's a potential violation of religious conscience in the Civil Rights Act of 1964. In my opinion, Title IX violates the rights of students by robbing them of a welcoming and comfortable protective environment during their most private and vulnerable moments using the bathroom and changing in our locker rooms. I would ask you to vote no on Title IX. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one, maybe two speakers. Uh, Reagan Longsign. First of all, I'd like to thank you very much for hearing all of our debates tonight. Uh, I'm Reagan Longsign. I'm a 17-year-old high school student in this area. I'm a senior in high school. And I think it is interesting that this whole Title IX Did debate. You, excuse me. Did yeah, I live in the Oshkosh area. OK. Oh, yeah. um, Oshkosh, okay. specifically. Okay. So um, I do find it interesting that this whole Title IX debate is about whether or not children should have to deal with certain ideas. And I do also find it interesting that I am the only high school student that has stepped up to talk about this topic. Um, as a Christian myself, I believe it immoral to 
um, take advantage of other, other people, other kids my age. And I find that this whole idea of having men go into women's locker rooms and having women go into men's locker rooms, I find that to be deeply disturbing and immoral. Uh, it's not just about what that person feels, but it's also whether or not um, those in the locker room who, do, who are actually supposed to be there want to see that. For myself, I know that if I were to walk into a male locker room and I were to see a woman getting changed, I would not feel comfortable with that. I would find that deeply immoral, regardless of what they think. Now, this is not me hating this person. Of course not. I don't want that. I just simply want to protect not only myself, but their reputation. And it is in this aspect of a dual respect for each other's rights that I ask you to vote no on Title IX. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One more. Yeah. And our final speaker will be Ronald Berry. in the Oshkosh Area School District. Um, I'll be honest, everything that I had was covered, pretty much. So I was going to tell you about, to remind you that this is political, as in it started off in, for women's safety in 1975, then Obama changed it, and then Trump changed it, and then Biden put an executive order, which within 60-some days could start all over again. Yeah. Um, I was also going to tell you about You've been told that you've been told that you're not going to lose money by your own lawyer, not some keyboard warrior lawyer like myself or other people. You've been told that you already have Wisconsin policies covered or Wisconsin law. You've been told your policies are covered. So that means that basically this will be an ideological, uh, ideological decision by yourself, because so you can't go say we're going to lose money like everybody's been telling you, because you've been told by your own lawyer that it's a very rare chance that you would lose it. Um. And then I'll say the safety. This was, to me, it's a safety issue. Um, you've heard many stories of children getting hurt. And if you have a daughter that's in sports, I'm sure you don't want to be the one that gets um, knocked out, as happened in North Carolina when a male athlete was there playing in women's sports and knocked her out. You don't want your teeth in a field hockey instant in, I think it was Georgia. It is a safety issue because biological men and biological women are not the same. And I don't care in first grade when you're trying to catch up and boys take longer, there's a big difference. There's a bone structure and science shows it. You don't wanna be, it's a safety issue for women in, <coughs> in the bathrooms for the simple reason. It's a privacy issue also. I don't want my son to sit there and see somebody else. He doesn't get to go in the bathroom with my wife. He doesn't get to go in the bathroom. That's how we raise our child. So I don't want to be the first time he sees some other child and have to ask me a question, because I can tell you from when I was a child, and it's not like transgender people have not. They're right. They've been way back when I was a kid. And the first time that I seen one was in the store, and if anybody remembers, cop's food. And to this day, I can remember exactly everything about it. It was traumatic to me. Because I didn't understand it. I was explained it, but I didn't understand it as a kid. Now imagine being another kid and have to try to explain that to yourself. You might not ask your parent. You might not ask the teacher. It just might be a confusion. The reason that we have classifications for everything is so it's not confusing, so it's not chaos. You don't, we have classifications in all of science. Why are humans different? And if, and if you go, because it causes chaos and it causes the problems that we see all the time, as far as, you know, confusion. And that's what this basically is. This is two sides that see something totally different, and it's confusion. And with that, if I can just finally say that doesn't, what I've said doesn't make me a bigot, because I love all people. Time. OK, we've got it. Thank you. OK, that ends our public forum for this evening. Next, we will move to a workshop. Mrs. Conrad Peters, and this is uh, the facility plan, the 10-year outlook.
we go. So today's presentation or workshop is around the KPI on finance and operations, that core area, and it's the facility plan 10-year outlook, which is worth 25%, excuse me, 20, 25% of the KPI. So with this, a KPI around facility planning and 10-year <laughs> outlook really focuses on how we are maintaining our facilities, how we are looking at replacement and transition, and how we are looking at our future and the life cycle of our facilities and our buildings. We are looking at preventative maintenance, along with a laid out and deliberate plan to make sure that we are good stewards and caretaker of our taxpayers' investments. This includes everything from upkeep from hardscape to asphalt to floor coverings and other stand standard items that need to be taken care of. And you can see um, later in the presentation that most of our capital improvement projects this year were around those regular caretaking and maintenance items. Also keep in mind that our 10-year plan does involve our four-phase plan for consolidation and reducing our number of schools, consolidating from 20 schools to 15. And we need to keep that in mind because that impacts um, what we are doing in our facilities and maintenance going forward. So why this matters is because these are our, it's our um, stewardship that safeguards the assets of our community. And we follow preventative maintenance and replacement plans on a set schedule. And as we do that, once again, that shows that we are good stewards. So for 2024, we are currently at a four-star rating. With that, that means we do have a 10-year uh, plan in place. We are reviewing it, and it's followed pending other budget needs. In order for us to get to a five-star rating, we really need to be contributing annu annually and um, specifically plan to fund 46. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in the presentation. So our celebrations is as part of our four phase plan, we are coming to the end of phase one with the opening of Menominee Elementary School and also with last year's opening of Val Phillips Middle School. One thing that we predicted in the opening of Val Phillips Middle School was that consolidation was going to have an annual operational savings. What we couldn't predict um, before we actually had a year in Val Phillips Middle School was what those operational savings were going to be. And we had also talked to the board about there may actually be an uptick in cost because air conditioning, it's lovely and we really appreciate it, especially in September of the beginning of the school year. Um, it, costs a little, it costs a little bit more. And so you will notice that in those annual operation savings, it's a little bit lower and we'll go over that than when we than we had predicted because we are capturing what those um, operations of the building is as well. So for Menominee, when we look at our projected results, we do not have captured yet what the actual energy operational savings are going to be. So the other part is is that this year we really focused on once again capital improvements such as the maintenance pieces. All projects were completed um, this summer, and some of the things um, that were um, completed are not going to be as fabulous or spectacular as opening a new building, but are absolutely necessary to maintain a safe uh, working learning environment. And so those include hardscape, roofing, flooring. Um, I don't have a picture, but I'd like to point out if you have been in Oshkosh North late, lately and you have seen the new carpeting and flooring that is in Oshkosh North, it looks pretty fabulous. Um, when I walked in earlier um, in the summer, I was like, this looks really good. So that was a major project. Um, electrical upgrades, elevator upgrades, plumbing, painting, replacements, and then also ADA upgrades within elevators, ramps, et cetera. And you can see the following schools, which are quite a few of them, that got those upgrades and projects. So opportunities for improvement. So when we think about moving from a four-star rating to a five-star rating, we need to be able to continue to add funds into 46 to increase the ability to pay for the 10-year plan fully from Fund 46. That's really where we want to be, to be at that five-star rating. This would reserve Fund 10 for annual maintenance needs, smaller things, so that we are really caretaking our buildings and we need to get on that cadence. The proposed budget for 24-25 does not include a transfer into Fund 46 
and will increase in a slight, will decrease Fund 46 um, altogether, and we'll talk about that, and there will be more information inside of our annual budget, um, which will be reviewed um, coming up at the next board meeting. So keeping in mind um, capital improvement plans, once again, we think about like large buildings, et cetera, but it's really about maintaining and the maintenance. And we wanna make sure that we are not deferring um, maintenance so that we are, um, we're planning once again for the future. So on also in these bullet points, you're gonna see that um, our capital improvement plan is organized by buildings. So every single building in our capital improvement plan is accounted for. We know what our upcoming um, projects, um, one that's um, talked about quite a bit is like boiler replacements or HVAC pieces. Um, all of those are accounted for and we have dollars and estimates as far as what needs to be for those upgrades. Um, the board, we do an annual board workshop in May. Um, Mr. Fox usually um, leads that, and it previews our summer projects, and know that you reviewed those projects on May 8th, and they were voted on um, at the board meeting on May 22nd. So upcoming capital improvement projects that need to be on our radar is hardscape and roofing. We have to, every single year, be maintaining those pieces. We do a survey or audit in September, so now that we've had our summer projects completed, we go into audit mode. We meet in October and we start to prioritize those needs and update all the pages in the plan on uh, what the prices are going to be and what that looks like. Once again, boilers, HVAC systems, et cetera, um, are often asked about. And so coming up for 2027 is really where we're seeing the first need for boilers or HVAC replacements. And that would be Reed and Oakwood be, would be the first in this cycle. But where it's interesting to look at a capital improvement project is we have things mapped out. And so if we do look at phase two of our consolidation plan, Oakwood is scheduled for um, expansion and renovation is what we're proposing. And so with that, we would make we would actually review and we would make changes based on that. So currently we are looking at anywhere from 1.1 to 1.3 million that we need to be budgeting annually for that. And once again, we'll be continuing to evaluate based on where we go um, pending board approval. So as a reminder from our last board meeting, we looked at the two-phase plan and this is the scope summary that would have to be taken into account into our capital improvement plan going forward. So our finance and strategy timeline. So how do we get to that five-star rating? We need to maintain our current fund balance levels and continue to invest in Fund 46. We need to be building up Fund 46 to the point where we can fund the annual capital improvement projects fully out of Fund 46. This strategy could take us over like 10 years to realize, it's gonna take us some time, but we need to decide if we are going to commit to that strategy to move us forward. Currently right now, Fund 46 is at approximately 7.4 million. We were at approximately 8 million at this time last year. And that concludes my presentation. I will entertain any questions. Mrs. Carolyn. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on slide seven. We have our cost savings for Bell Phillips at 500,000 and 1.3 million of savings due to Menominee. How did we come up with, like what kind of things are saving us money to get those numbers? Yep. Absolutely. So for both Bell Phillips and Menominee, and specifically for Menominee, it is consolidation and efficiency and staffing that contribute to the majority of, um, of the savings because the majority of our budget is our wonderful staff, our personnel, et cetera, within there. Um, if you note, I can't remember what the exact number was, but it was over 600,000 when we first reported out on Bell Phillips, um, the operational, um, uptick is because it's a bigger building, mm -hmm. and so that's why we're about approximately $50,000 less because when we looked at the actual energy savings. So for Menominee, we're gonna be looking at three different buildings, what is that going to look like? But keep in mind that 1.3 million is going to come down because of how much it's going to cost to operate Menominee. Thank you. 
Uh, Dr. Herzog. Thank you. One thing I do wonder about is what impact um, TIF districts would have on increasing our budget, that is, those who, those TIF districts that come to the end of their, their life, I'm not sure what the right terminology is, but um, when they are finished, so to speak, that might be helpful for us to take a look at too. I know that in the past, I'm quite sure that Lakeside used uh, some TIF dollars for that expansion back in about 2013 or 14, um, because that, that may not pay for everything, but it might allow us to put those dollars into Fund 46 or use them, <coughs> excuse me, for some other facilities use. So to me, that's again looking at how can we be good stewards of the finances that come to us, and that is one source of funding. Thank you. Dr. Hess. So I'm, I'm questioning the, how do we come to, I, I, I kind of look at the, I think it's 1.2 to 1.3 million per year. How do we come to that's the reasonable number to be, to be budgeting? To me, it feels a little light, but I'm curious how we come to that. How we come to that, that actual number. So right. that is, so when we look at our 10 year plan like laid out, in order to maintain what we currently have and keep it safe and functioning, you add up, you add up the different columns for the different buildings based on those project, project estimates, it ends up being 1.1 to 1.3 is what we project that we can very much sustain going forward. So you've got a list of Correct. Things that you want there's to a do. there's a there's a spreadsheet with many tabs, one for each building, and it has listed out exactly what the upcoming um, projects or needs are going to be, and mapped out by year. So, for example, when we talk about Reed and Oakwood being on a boiler replacement cycle, on the 2027 column, those are listed there with what that potential replacement cost would be. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you very much for your report. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're moving into the consent resolution, and please remember we are pulling number one of the consent agenda. The board has been furnished with background material on each item or has discussed at a previous meeting. These will be acted upon with one vote without discussion. Period. Is there a motion for the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Harlan and Wright? Sure. Ready? Call the roll. Do it. Aye. Herzog. Aye. Hess. Aye. Smiltnik. Aye. Wright. Aye. Wyman. Aye. Harlan. Aye. Resolution carries. Thank you. Let's move back to number one, personnel, regular appointments, temporary appointments, resignation and salaries. Is there a motion? So moved. So, second. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the first. It was uh, Carlin. Carlin oh, Herzog. Herzog. Thank you. Discussion. Dr. Herzog. Thank you. Um, in various um, rooms around the state over the last few years, meetings uh, discussing the uh, shortage of certified or licensed teachers in the state of Wisconsin, one of the suggestions for addressing the teacher shortage is to turn to some of our retirees. Um, there are also grow your own programs. There are add-on licensure programs for second or third career individuals who have at least a bachelor's degree and wish to um, move into a, a, a school setting as a teacher. I just wanted to uh, commend several names on this list. I recognize at least four who are retired teachers from the Oshkosh Area School District. They've been out of teaching uh, well into their retirement beyond, I think it's a 75 day minimum. Thank you. Um, and who have, who have chosen to help out our students. These bring years of experience, uh, not only within our district, but also in working effectively with students. So I, I think this is a wonderful example of one of the ways that we can make sure that we have highly qualified teachers uh, serving students in the Oshkosh Area School District. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Call the roll. Herzog. Aye. Hess. Aye. Smiltnik. Aye. Wright. Aye. Wyman. Wyman. Aye. Carlin. Aye. DeWitt. Aye. Resolution carries. 
Thank you. And our next individually considered resolution is the approval of 2024 Title IX policy update subject to current pending legal action filed in federal courts in several federal districts challenging the constitutionality and legal interpretation of the federal Department of Education's directives as to the implementation of Title IX and the following Title IX policy updates. So moved. Second. DeWitt and Carlin? Uh, yes? Was it DeWitt and Carlin? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Discussion. All right. Um, so we'll, we'll start with uh, welcoming um, uh, Sabrina Johnson and Mark Capricious, uh, legal counsel, um, back to um, uh, for the board uh, for discussion uh, for tonight. Um, I wanted to go through uh, just some comments um, just related to the discussions um, and uh, maybe provide some clarifications on some questions that we've gotten in. So I uh, just have a, some things I want to be able to work through before the presentation, and then we'll uh, open it up for our, our guests and then uh, for some board um, board discussion. Uh, first of all, um, just to provide some clarity on uh, what was uh, some questions around bringing back Title IX from our July 4th, or from our July 10th um, vote um, as a revote. Um, just want to be clear that we're coming back tonight as a different resolution and not a revote. Um, which is important um, uh, to include the, uh, so tonight's vote includes the injunctions filed by Moms for Liberty uh, in a July 26th report in the context of a Kansas court case. Uh, without these injunctions or pending court action, uh, we would not be able to bring back the same resolution. So it is a different resolution that we'll be voting on tonight than it was in, uh, in July 10th. Um, second, uh, we have two uh, we have two more schools that have been added um, to the injunction list, um, and th those were added as of August 28th. Um, uh, those two schools are Tipler and Oakwood. Um, so uh, these schools were added to a list um, from uh, July 26th, um, which included Traeger Elementary, Traeger Middle School, and West High School. So for a total of five schools uh, for us that are currently under this injunction. Uh, this means that if we pass the new federal regulations, we would administer the 2020 Title IX regulations for these schools and the new federal regulations at our other schools because it is per school for our injunctions. Um, for the last seven years, under administrative guideline uh, 2260E, uh, non-discrimination guidelines related to students who are transgender uh, and students non-conforming to gender role and stereotypes. So again, over the last seven years, we've had this policy. Our transgender students have had uh, and will continue to have protections uh, against discrimination in our school district, uh, no matter the outcome of the Title IX vote tonight. Um, so just wanted to be clear on that um, related to our policies. Uh, across the district, uh, boys and girls' bathrooms and locker rooms are separate, um, so there is not mixing. So boys' and girls' uh, bathrooms and locker rooms are separate, and single stall bathrooms are available um, as needed. Uh, we have and will continue to work with all families uh, as specific concerns come up um, to support all of our students across all of our schools. And that's a, an important commitment that we continue to make uh, as we work through um, uh, any situations that, that people have against the specifics for their children uh, to make sure that uh, those uh, concerns can be addressed. Uh, the first, and this was mentioned already, but the first Office of Civil Rights complaint was filed in Wisconsin against a school district not complying with Title IX, uh, the new Title IX federal regulations. Uh, and if we are in that, uh, uh, in that realm, uh, as we would move forward, uh, these complaints take a significant amount of time and energy, uh, which include our legal counsel, uh, administrators, and secretarial staff to process those complaints. So uh, certainly something we want to uh, uh, try to avoid. Uh, the WIA governs uh, boys and girls sports participation and we follow their guidelines so we don't make those regulations. Uh, so we follow what the WIA has, um, has laid out for us uh, across the state. Uh, following federal law and regulations allows us to comply with the expectations of receiving millions of dollars in federal funding. Uh, we did hear previously that maybe the risk of that is low, but I wanted to provide some context into just mechanically what that means for our staff. Um, if we don't pass um, this policy, um, we can't move forward with the funding application process. So essentially there's a button that needs to be uh, pushed and, and approved um, to provide assurances that we're in compliance with federal law and federal regulations. Um, so we will not, um, I, I will not administer that and have anybody um, you know, push that button unless we are, we are in full compliance. Um, and so, uh, so that would either mean us being locked out of the application process for federal funds um, or 
um, we would need to pick up the phone, talk to the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction or the Department of Education and Washington, D.C., and negotiate our way through you know, this process. So, um, so that, again, is very time intensive as we're, uh, as we're moving forward. So, um, so mechanically, that's what that would need to look like. That would start uh, for us in March. Um, with our Perkins funding um, and then continue on uh, throughout the year um, as we have other federal funds that would come in. Um, and then lastly, I just want to clarify, um, uh, with the passing, if the Title IX is passed tonight, uh, we do not need to hire another coordinator at the district level. Um, Sabrina Johnson um, and uh, um, uh, Sabrina Johnson is our, our Title IX coordinator um, and works in that role through her HR office. Um, so Matt Kammer also um, is a, uh, uh, works um, with Title IX and would be another coordinator. So we have two people, uh, again, male and female, to be able to uh, uh, make sure that we're administering that accordingly. So, so I just wanted to start with those comments tonight, um, and uh, hopefully that addressed uh, some of the questions, uh, emails that we had received. Um, and then I'll turn it over to uh, Sabrina and Mark for any, any comments or presentations that you'd have. Just in the mic. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Um, a lot of the key points in the communication the staff report have been covered by Dr. Davis, so we really wanted to be here for any questions that you might have before the vote. Um, how does the new complaint that was recently filed against school districts that aren't complying with Title IX uh, regulations, how does that affect, or how does that affect school districts that haven't complied, and what type of money and resources could it take our district if we had one of those complaints filed against us for not being in compliance? Yeah, uh, thank you for bringing that up. The, uh, what happened in Waukesha County was a group has filed a, a complaint with OCR, okay, Office of Civil Rights. And at that point, they would determine whether or not there's enough evidence to, to warrant an investigation. Okay, and an investigation by OCR, you know, obviously will take some time, and then ultimately the district, if they're found to be not in compliance, would be issued a corrective action order. Okay, um, now I would say that part of that complaint from Waukesha County was that it was really twofold. One, that the district did not um, adopt the policy, but secondly, and probably more importantly, is that the allegations are that the board created a hostile work environment through some of the statements made through the deliberation process. So that is that's more of the jurisdictional issue was more of the statements of the board members, more so than the inaction on adoption of the board policy, although that was a part of their argument as well. I read a legal um, document or an online document, and it had said that um, that organization plans to file complaints against any school district that hasn't adopted the entirety of Title IX, um, including uh, Winnicani, who passed it with some amendments. Do you have any additional information on that? Yeah, I, I think you know there, there's exposure there um, by not adopting a policy that there could be a complaint filed with OCR. Following up on that question, so. Um, as soon as there's an Office of Civil Rights complaint filed, I assume are you are a legal counsel who deals with those. Uh, what are the steps immediately that the district might take and how quickly does it start incurring staff time, legal uh, counsel, and what's the cost associated with that immediately upon there being a filing of a complaint? Yeah, that, I would say that it, it takes a while prior to an investigation to commence. Um, an investigation will require probably more staff time than anything else because they will meet with a number of the administrators to collect a number of documents. They'll review um, videos of this board meeting. Uh, it'll, it'll take a lot of time administratively to address that. How uh, quickly does the district have to respond though if there's a complaint? I'm not sure the number of days that we have to respond, but I know that we do immediately start to um, get the data that they're asking for, getting, like he said, all the materials, um, interviews. So we, we do take those seriously, and as soon as they come in, we start to act on them. Yeah, if, if you have a yeah, to answer your question, it would be, um, you know, once you know, the OCR decides to investigate, there'll be a pretty aggressive timeline that they'll set forth. I have a question. Uh, if we accept 
Title IX, we will have five schools that will be under the old rules and the remainder of the schools under the new Title IX. Tell me how that works and what the differences would be in protection for those students that are not under the new Title IX. Well, this is, first of all, uncharted territory, right? We've never really seen anything comparable to this. Um, however, you know, what we would do is exactly what you would have proposed, which is we have two policies. We have the old policy that applies to the affected schools, and we have the new policy that would affect the residual schools. Um, so what protections, and I talked about this, and I don't have the date that I was here, but I'm pretty confident it was last month. Uh, we talked about some of the elements that make Wisconsin unique, and that is specifically the Whitaker case. And we talked about that from, the Whitaker is the Kenosha Unified School mm -hmm. District. And that was a, um, a matter where a transgender child um, it was found that the district did in fact um, discriminate based on sex-based factors. So in other words, um, in the Seventh Circuit, of which Wisconsin is in there, uh, within the, the Seventh Circuit, there are protections under that decision for children who would be um, transgender. Had a, one follow-up question. So hypothetically, the district can adopt and vote yes on Title IX, but parents can still choose to join the Kansas injunction, which would put their kid in their school district under the old Title IX rules, technically, right? That is correct, yeah, that is what Judge Brooms from Kansas ordered. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hess? So I've got a couple of questions. I think one, uh, maybe Brian or Dr. Davis shared with you, I was kind of asking, what is the interpretation of this legal language that we have here in this resolution in terms of subject to currently pending legal action? And I was kind of wondering, what, I mean, what exactly does that mean? Does that mean the Supreme Court has to say no to this thing? Does that mean one of the other circuits definitively come to a conclusion. What, to me, it seems like this is setting up some sort of trigger. And I'm, I could be completely wrong. Maybe I should have asked Molly, but I can't talk to her. <laughs> so I'm asking you. Okay, are you referring to the resolution? I'm, I'm referring the to the resolution language. That, that the board is That the board is to consider. consider. Okay. Right. Um, and the language says that it's subject to current pending legal action filed in federal court. Right. Um, so we, we've looked at that and we've determined that that's a substantive change and therefore it is a new motion. Okay, it's not a you know, rescission or a, right. um, reconsideration. Um, you know, if, if you're asking me, you know, does that, could the Supreme Court change this? Yeah, I think that's exactly what this this clause states in there. Is that subject to interpretation by a federal court of jurisdiction, you know, this policy is applicable. And, and is that like the only recourse, the only, it has to hit the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court says no, or is there any other facility within those eight other cases? Yeah. I appreciate it's yeah. the Kansas case that is affecting us right now with the injunction. Yeah. So as I read this resolution, what it's saying is that you're, the board is adopting the Title IX regulations, the 2024 regulations, with a carve out that says that, but unless courts tell us otherwise, okay? okay. And currently, this is, this is a, frankly a pretty useful way of you know, addressing the fact that we have some schools that are subject to the injunction. Okay, uh, you were here on, on August 14th and at the time you'd suggested minimal chance of losing funding. My question is, is, is there, has anything changed in the landscape that you have seen where, is that still your opinion or? Well, again, there's been some boards across the state who have um, chosen to just sit this one out and not take any action, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and they're willing to take that risk. 
Now the answer to, to, to your question is, you know, do I still assess the risk in a similar manner? Um, there's no reason to believe that my our discussion in August is any different than it is today. Mm -hmm. I will say that a couple of things that have changed is, is one, we're up to 26 states now that are um, by court order uh, enjoined from enjoining the, de the Department of Ed from enforcing those regulations. And secondly, in the Sixth Circuit, oral arguments are scheduled for next month. Okay, so this is on kind of a, uh, a fast track to the Supreme Court. So I believe we'll likely get a decision on this matter sooner rather than later. Can I also ask a follow-up to that? Can you explain the difference between you saying us losing federal funding versus what Dr. Davis has established that we cannot apply for federal funding and mm -hmm. therefore do not have that in our, um, in our coffers? Well, if you don't apply for federal funds, you won't get federal funds, right? Exactly. So, like so is it, so as you're saying, yes, is the chance that the, any kind of federal action takes time, as they always do with these complaints, which is typically a corrective action, is that's how you end up losing your federal funding. However, is the net result of the fact that we are out of compliance, does that mean that we cannot apply for federal funding legally? Yeah, without seeing the actual grant application, you know, I, I can't speak to that. I do believe Dr. Davis, you know, referenced the fact that there usually is a conditional element in there that says that, you know, the district, by virtue of receiving these funds, shall follow all applicable federal laws and regulations. Correct. Can I follow that up? Do you really believe that he can't do the calling of the Department of Education and that they're going to limit the funds on every single school district that has an injunction on one or two. I mean, I think, I think to me, the logic of saying that the, co the, the chance of losing funding is minimal kind of suggests that you believe that somehow there is an approach to just say there is a checkbox that I can't check. Seems a little far-fetched to believe that that's all that is impeding us from receiving the funds. Well, is, oops, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, just want to be like that's the application process. So it's not I get it. fetched. Like that's that's what the application process is. So in absence of that, the ability to fill out that application, it would mean a phone call then right. to the entities um, to be able to work through that. So that that's just right. that's what I was working through. Right. 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 And is there any guarantee that the entities would be interested in making in basically saying it's okay that you are not following? federal regulations and your, your law. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I don't no know. Yeah, yeah, we just, we don't know. That, right. Yeah, I would agree. I, don't, I think we don't know. Um, I think the evidence would indicate that there's not been a school district that has been denied federal funding. However, we're in uncharted territories with this case. And, and one more, what, yeah. was there somebody else? Uh, just a follow up on the, you mentioned Whitaker and I believe the Seventh Circuit also has the AC versus Martinsville and the SE and what is it? SEBE versus Vigo County. My understanding of, of Whitaker, they said bathrooms, right? And then I believe AC versus Martinsville said, also said bathrooms. And then it's this last one where the AC versus Martinsville and the Vigo County, I believe the appeal got, those two got combined together but that one said bathrooms and locker rooms with the exception of showers. And w when I look at, I, I believe you provided us with, again, the, we've got administrative guidelines. Right. And that seems to be pretty consistent with what our administrative guidelines are detailing out. Is that your understanding of what the Seventh Circuit requires of us because of these case precedents of what is allowed and, and then so too you know, I think we talk about it is a long-standing belief there's parental permission in our mm -hmm. in our present administrative guidelines and that to me seemed very consistent with what those individual cases what they were dealing with there is that reasonably your understanding of where yeah I, I do, I do, I do believe I do believe the Seventh Circuit you know, prohibits, or I should say, um, prohibits discrimination based on sex and sex-based 
discrimination as well, which includes persons who are transgender. Mm -hmm. And the, in fact, the, 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 I mean, I, it would be hard to, to detail every single fact scenario. Right. However, right. you know, to the extent that discrimination is defined as, you know, harassment in this case, um, is defined as, you know, treating people differently based on uh, their sex, mm -hmm. then that would qualify. Okay. Anything from this end? Tate? I have a question. If we do not adopt the Title IX regulations this evening, and there's more court cases, would it be possible for it to come back to us? Are we just gonna keep coming back and forth? I don't think we'll be able to unless we come with a new resolution, right? Well, that, that would go to the parliamentary procedure element that I believe we it was discussed with Dr. Davis earlier, um, which is to say, you, you can't bring up a matter multiple that's already times been that's mm -hmm. already been voted on. Dr. Herzog. Thank you. <clears throat> this is a very complex issue, and yet at its heart, I think it's, this, it's not so complex in that I've read all the emails. I've consulted with an education attorney with more than 20 plus years experience. I've watched all three OASD training videos on Title IX. Um, in preparation for this meeting. And I reflected on a number of things. First of all, all of us at this, I was gonna say this table, but these multiple tables, have taken an oath of office to uphold the Wisconsin and the U.S. constitutions as uh, a, a result of our being elected. The Wisconsin Constitution states that we have a legal obligation to educate all students to me, that means all students, and that includes students who identify as members of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, I served as a building level administrator in a school where a child uh, had been bullied, and as administrators, we probably should have known that, but we didn't. And that child took her life. She died by suicide because she'd been harassed. not because of her sex or gender identity, but by where she lived. And I, I moved by that because of the, the, um, the great amount of data we have on youth behavior, or risk, risk behavior surveys, and we're talking about a, a population that is um, overrepresented in terms of some of those mental health issues which result in self-harm and, and perhaps taking one's life. Wisconsin, according to the education attorney I consulted, noted that Wisconsin has privacy rights, privacy laws. And we also have anti-discrimination law which has protections based on sex, sexual orientation, and gender identity, and we have our own Administrative Guideline 2260E, which addresses non-discrimination guidelines related to students who are transgender and those non-conforming to gender role stereotypes. And yet we've heard over the last two board meetings of some very, very concerning um, stories of former students who may, uh, may be adults in the community, as well as current students who, who are bullied, who are discriminated against, and yet our obligation is to educate all students. I think the concern about OCR complaints and DPI complaints, if we do not adopt these rules, are very real and would be extremely costly to the school district. There are other ways for individuals who disagree with Title IX, um, to ensure that their school is exempted, and we've seen some of that already. Many of the concerns that I've, I've heard and seen in, in emails relative to um, recommendations to vote no deal with restrooms, locker rooms, and showering. Our guideline 
appears to me to preclude or not allow uh, showering by students of different genders. I think that there's a lot of misinformation out there about the issue of showering and, and people suddenly deciding to change their, their gender or their sexual identity or maybe change mm -hmm. it from day to day. Um, so I will be voting yes on this. I think we have a, not only a legal obligation to educate all children, but a moral obligation to educate all children. And I'm concerned that we need to we need to have grace. We need to have understanding of those who oppose this mm -hmm. uh, proposed adoption. But at the same time, we have to protect all of our students. And to me, the best way to do that is to adopt these guidelines. I'm reminded of a quote from President Abraham Lincoln. Of course, the context was very different, but the co the the uh, concept is, I think, applicable today with malice toward none, with charity for all. So we respect all opinions and we listen and ultimately this board has to make a decision. I'm also reminded of a pen I, I picked up um, in my visits around the, the community which states love for all, hatred for none. And I got it from the Ahmadiyya Muslim community of Oshkosh, Wisconsin. And I think that captures what we need to practice in this community. We don't always agree on everything, but we need to respect our differences and find our commonalities so that we can do what we're here for, and that is to educate mm -hmm. our children to the best that we can by putting children first. Thank you. Mrs. Carlin. I wanted to follow after Dr. Herzog because she touched on a lot of the points that I was going to say this evening. What my guiding principle, you've heard me say it a million times, is always what is best for students. By not adopting Title IX this evening, we are risking federal funding. Is that a small risk? I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. We're on uncharted waters. So for me, that is a risk that could happen. And I don't think that is best for students. The proper venue to challenge Title IX is in the courts, and we see that happening already. It's not the job of the school board to challenge the federal government. What is best for students is using our resources to fight a federal mandate. What's best for students? I do not think it is. I believe the proper venue to challenge Title IX is in Washington. We do not have the authority to edit or change what is prevented or presented in Title IX, but we are legally bound to adopt it. But my biggest concern is related to the messaging it would send to our LGBTQ community. Voting against Title IX does not promote inclusivity, and it goes against our core values. There, I think there's a lot of confusion on what Title IX does and does not do. Um, some of the, the things that we heard this evening were a little concerning to me. There seems to be some kind of fear um, of people that are transgender in locker rooms. My child is not safe. And that's a stigma that I think we need to break. Transgender people are vastly not violent or predators. That's just a stigma that continues to be out there, and I, I think we need to break that stigma. My last comment is the lack of civility on this issue has been very disheartening, to say the least. I want to, make sh I want to say that my heart is broken for the individuals that have been harassed on social media Earlier today, the board received an email with several links to disparaging and quite frankly disgusting content aimed at some of the people that have spoken at our meetings, labeling them with terrible names I will not repeat. Uh, that is not okay. And that is not our community. That is not what we're about. What is best for students? Kindness. 
inclusivity, and support. I will be voting yes for Title IX. Thank you. Dr. Hess. Dr. Hess, Mrs. Miltnik, and Mr. Wright. Oh, okay. I think first, I, you know, I, I got to say I appreciate that everybody that came out today, and I'm proud of Oshkosh for how civil we were tonight. So that, uh, and I also saw that a lot of people cringed, and and there were uncomfortable things said, and I appreciate that that's tough to hear, and I appreciate some of the angst that that caused, but you came anyways and you came out in support and I, I, I fully appreciate that. I also want to say that during the election, uh, I think there was a question asking about how I would communicate and I made this comment back about, well, I would actually respond. And now that I've seen how much, I got to say I'm sorry to some of you when I said the thing that I said there, that it is amazing the number of comments that we see and I had a number of people reach out to me and make a comment about President Wyman has responded back and she didn't say much. And I had to say it to a number of individuals, so I feel like we need to say it in public too, that we have to understand that when you email the entirety of the board, the president responds back for us. But so too, when she does that and she includes all of us, she has to do in a manner that doesn't at all attempt to sway us because of the whole walking quorum issue. So, you know, I, I thank you, President Wyman, for responding back to everybody. Uh, and I haven't been able to get back to, to people too, and I apologize for that, but I, I certainly did read everything. But I wanted to make clear to everybody, there was a lot of comments on this, and it's, it's tough to respond to everybody. Uh, I think that what I have, have heard in this community thus far, I've struggled to, to ascertain what is real and what is not real. And so I have considered this quite substantially and researched as much as I can. And I want to convey my thoughts on this uh, and why I'm going to vote the way that I am. And I think it's important to understand the history of these new rules that, you know, Title IX has been in place for over 50 years. And it was simple and easy to interpret. And in, in 2020, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled on the Bostock case uh, involving Title VII. And in this case, it was a, a question of whether somebody could be terminated uh, on the basis of sexual orientation or by extension gender identity. The ruling did determine that firing an individual for being gay or transgender violated Title VII. However, the court explicitly made clear that the opinion did not sweep beyond Title VII to other federal or state laws that prohibit sex discrimination, or even in the content, context of Title VII itself and employment, the ruling did not purport to address bathrooms, locker rooms, or anything of the kind. Or the Department of Education under the direction of an executive order issued by President Biden on the first day of office ignored these exemptions to implement the new Title IX rules. To be clear, I absolutely believe that sexual orientation and sexual gender identity should be protected. However, as in the original Title IX laws, there needs to be very specific exemptions to account for privacy considerations or appropriately handle First Amendment rights when these issues conflict with protected religious liberties. Uh, at the present time, there are eight federal cases, all of which current rulings agree that the new final rules are contrary to law and have in issued injunctions on the Department of Education from enforcing these rules. This means, as we've heard, 26 different states will not be using these rules. In addition, the Kansas case involves Moms for Liberty, and thus any school with a student of a Moms for Liberty member is enjoined. At present, we have the five schools. And I suspect that this list will grow. To me, this was a failed opportunity on behalf of the Department of Education. They had their chance to effectuate positive change for the LGBTQ community and others in the educational setting. However, as Judge Doherty pointed out in the Louisiana case, this was an enacted in a hurried and sloppy manner. The court cases involved a slew of legal arguments, 
many over the debate on powers of state versus federal government or the executive branch and major questions of doctrine. All of these accounts, all of these accounts, the courts have ruled against the Department of Education. And while I do not dismiss this, what I consider pugilistic fighting between government entities is not what is most important to me. Rather, I'm concerned about what will happen here in Oshkosh and to our students and families. There are two major issues that influence my decision tonight. The first that involves the question of who has access and to which spaces. Again, we've talked about we have the administrative guidelines, uh, which are based on the Whitaker and the AC versus Martinsville, uh, and it defines who has access in those cases, saying a student who is transgender and has held a deep belief, followed by a belief consistently over a period of time, and is supported by the student's parent or guardian, and for which the student has sought guidance or counseling in, the coming, in coming to the decision, will be permitted to access these spaces. Further, it stipulates that transgender students request use of restrooms or locker rooms the district will review on a case-by-case -case basis. However, in the final rule on page 33, 819, the standard of who is reduced to relying upon a student's consistent assertion to determine their gender identity or on written confirmation of the student's gender identity by the student, parent, counselor, coach, or teacher. This removes the need for parental consent, which the Seventh Circuit case had, and because of the use of or, reduces the standard down to simply written confirmation of the student's gender identity by the student. I am skeptical of this low of a standard. Next is the issue of where students with differing gender identity might have access to. Presently, the Seventh Circuit guides us to allow bathrooms and locker rooms, but not showers. But the new Title IX rule will, if pushed, allow access to showers. In the Kansas court case, the legal response given to questioning when the potential harms to a student plaintiff claimed was that this young woman couldn't prove that any harm would come. And while I appreciate that this is a common legal defense, it seems to me that the whole point of originally allowing sex-separated spaces or facilities in Title IX was the concern over privacy issues. I was at Oshkosh North this morning and will concede that the bathrooms that I saw had mostly stalls and that this isn't at all different from using porta potties in a public event. The locker rooms used for athletics or participating in phi ed classes were definitely open. Certainly there were private rooms available if students were uncomfortable. But the shower facilities were what one might expect in communal showers. To me, I struggle with the locker rooms, but I had to draw a hard line before showers. Yesterday, we received an email from a constituent, and Dr. Davis responded, including the entire board, suggesting showers are typically not taken at school. To confirm this assertion, I talked to both my son and daughter who graduated from West. Now, my son was never in sports. <clears throat> And so he only took individual sports as a phi ed class. And he agreed, but throughout the entire four years of high school, he took a shower once. My daughter, however, was a much different story. She participated in volleyball for a couple of years and soccer all four years. And she suggested that the coaches would encourage athletes to take strength training and conditioning as a phys physical education course during the zero hour. Doing this, she claimed that she would get sweaty enough sufficiently where taking a shower was a very common occurrence. A teacher friend of mine also confirmed the idea of athletes at zero hour showering is not an infrequent thing. Although the administrators that I talked to at North were also less sure about this. My second concern is over the revised standards of sex-based discrimination. Under the present rules, harassment must be so severe and pervasive that it effectively denies access to a program or activity. The new rules change this to severe or pervasive and that it limits or denies access. This lower standard, as all eight federal court cases have agreed upon, will either compel or inhibit free speech. The Supreme Court 
has the Davis standard in regards to free speech in an educational setting, which dictates that the harassment must take place in a context subject to the school, school district's control. As the new final rules include online harassment or even harassment outside of the United States. Again, Judge Doty opined that essentially the harassment standard allows for one political ideology to dominate the educational landscape while either silencing the other or calling the other harassment. In West Virginia versus the Board of Education, or West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett, the Supreme Court said, government cannot prescribe what shall be orthodox for citizens to, or to force citizens to confess by word or act their faith. And in Texas versus Johnson, they suggested the government may not prohibit the expression of an idea simply because society finds the idea offensive or disagreeable. In large part, my vote the other week on the books was based on my strong belief in the First Amendment and not wanting to censor ideas, especially in an educational setting. It is clear to me, <coughs> as it was clear to the judges in the eight federal court cases, that this will violate our students' and parents' First Amendment rights. The judge in the Kansas case noted that no attorney in the court could provide an answer to the question as to what should a parent advise their children as to what they can say in schools on the topic of gender identity or sexual orientation. I would not dare to espouse any particular view, right or wrong, but rather point out that there is a large diversity of opinions and would again suggest that we as the elected officials should not promote any rule that picks a side. Unfortunately, I believe the new standards do just that and again point out that all court cases agree with this sentiment and just because Wisconsin is not a party to it doesn't mean that the impact doesn't happen in our schools. I have heard over and over again that we as a district should not proceed because we will not be in compliance with federal law. However, this statement deliberately leaves out much of what is known, and I would argue that we, what we might be doing is choosing not to comply with a regulation that has been deemed contrary to law, and I have no problems not being in compliance with a regulation that is contrary to law. In fact, the University of Wisconsin, last month I looked this up, they too chose not to comply with this. And at the time, they did not have all of their campuses on there. And they did so because they felt that these lower standards was going to have a substantial increase in staff time in evaluating all the harassment claims. Again, I regret that the Department of Education, in my opinion, wasted a legitimate opportunity to bring positive change to groups that have been historically marginalized. I strongly suspect that regardless of what we decide tonight, that the courts will eventually make this decision for us. As have been stated, we already have policies that protect gender identity, policy 2260, and not passing this tonight doesn't mean that we're going to allow discrimination or bullying or anything of that sort. So for now, I believe that the final rules promulgated by the Department of Education do not bring about additional rights for additional, or for individuals or do bring about additional rights for individuals that deserve more than what our society presently affords them, but at a significant expense to those Title IX was originally intended to protect and many others. So I myself cannot bring myself to do this and I'm gonna vote no on this resolution. Thank you. Mrs. Smiltnik. Here's the, the thing, as a public school district and a public school system, the Oshkosh Area School District and its board have a responsibility to provide a safe learning environment for all students. We can't forget that. They are students, no matter how else we describe them, they are students first. They are students who are there to learn and they harm no one else by simply being who they are, no matter who they are. They have a right to go to school, to learn, to participate in school activities, and they have a right to do that without fear of discrimination, threats, assault, or harassment. This policy doesn't change a thing related to bathrooms, athletics, locker rooms, or showers. It is about students being able to access their education without fear of discrimination, threats, assaults, or harassment. It's that simple. <coughs> Our duty is a board to put policies in place that protect all and each student, every student, at a minimum level. 
and I will say this explicitly, it is our duty to protect trans students. It is our duty to protect non-binary students. It is our duty to protect LGBTQ plus students. It is our duty to protect students who are pregnant and students who are parents. I list students that fit into these categories not because it excludes other students or infringes on their rights. Their rights and the base level of protection we provide them in school is not in question. I repeat, it is our duty to protect all, each, every student at minimal level. It's also our duty to make fiscally sound decisions, maximize funding opportunities, and to comply with the law. I'm in the business of helping people to comply with the law, to navigate it. I'm not in the business of breaking the law. And that's exactly what OASD is doing right now. We are breaking the law. Our district is putting itself in legal jeopardy by being out of compliance right now. We have two open Office of Civil Rights complaints against us already, and we are prime targets for more complaints and potentially lawsuits. Being the subject of an administrative enforcement action is never fun, and more importantly, lawsuits and enforcement actions cost us real money when we fail to protect all students. Additionally, as Dr. Davis pointed out, yearly a district staff must attest that the district is complying with federal regulations, including Title IX, in order to apply for federal funds for the coming year. Dr. Davis has told us that he will not instruct a staff member to do that unless we enact these policies. If a staff member were to attest that we are in compliance in an effort to secure federal funds, it would be fraud, it would be perjury, it would be a lie. Therefore, it's not that the feds would take away seven or eight percent of our budget in an enforcement action. It's that we, as a school district, simply couldn't apply for it unless we're willing to lie and open ourselves up to even more legal liabilities. Title IX isn't a government overstep. It's really the absolute minimum that we teach kids starting in 4K. Treat everyone fairly, act with kindness. Legally, it is the right thing to do to pass this new Title IX related policies. More importantly, morally, ethically, it is the right thing to do. We must put students first. We must give each student the same base level of protection against harassment, bullying, and discrimination, no matter how they present to us. So it's not just that we must put students first. It must, it's that we must protect them as students first. I'll be voting to integrate the new Title IX regulations into OASD policy. It's pretty much the least we can do, but it is undoubtedly the right thing to do. Thank you, Mr. Wright. Um, First of all, everyone was great here tonight. So thank you community for showing up and listening to everyone's uh, points of view um, on this subject. And I've been thinking about this for a long time. And so in my mind, I kind of went through a little decision tree. Because what's important is student safety. That's number one, protecting our students safely, all students, right? and then also protecting the district. So we all know that OASD didn't come up with this policy or regulation. This isn't something that we wrote. It came to us from the federal government and it'll likely be decided in the courts through probably the Supreme Court, I would guess, someone way, way above us, right? But in the meantime, um, most districts in our area have unanimously, uh, or Appleton and Green Bay for sure, unanimously approved the new Title IX protections. And AMRO. And AMRO. And those, these protections have been in effect. <clears throat> and I haven't heard of any concerns about any of the things that have been brought up on social media on a regular basis. Uh, our, we have a bathroom policy in this district um, we have policies. None of that is changing. WIAA uh, is in charge of overseeing all of our sports, right? So they're in control of that. We're not creating uh, policy. In addition to that, parents that are really passionate about this, and there are a lot of them, but in full disclosure, since the Kansas injunction came into effect, all three of my kids that are in different OESD schools, Traeger, Tipler, and West, all three of those schools are following under, are gonna follow under the old guidelines. So all three of my kids are going to be under the old guidelines until whenever 
the federal court decide this issue, right? So voting yes protects us from all legal liabilities um, as a district, right? We're not getting um, any injunctions placed, placed on us, none of that, right? Bathroom policy, that stuff staying the same. Sports, not determined by us, right? But there's not gonna be changes there, okay? So, and there's more um, harassment protections and bullying protections for people that should be put in place, right? So, in my thought process, we're both providing student safety and protecting the district um, with a yes vote from me. So that's how I'm gonna be voting. Thank you. I can take a moment. When we voted on, not this, but the last time we talked and took a vote on Title IX, I voted no. And I really struggled with that. And what I realized was I voted no because I got caught up in the process. I didn't like how it was coming down to us. I didn't like all the unanswered questions. And the questions keep coming. But what I'm realizing is we're not going to solve this as a board. This needs to go higher. This needs to go to somebody that's going to make an edict that's going to come down and we're going to accept it. it. It's just too crazy right now. But in the meantime, what we can control is focusing on what we're supposed to be focusing on and that's our students. And it's protection from discrimination, exclusion, harassment, and most importantly for everyone to have a fair educational experience. We can continue to prolong this. We've seen now that we have the Office uh, for Civil Rights filed. Uh, they're starting to file. I don't want our administration and our staff to have to go through that. We need to get back to education. We need to get back to literacy and learning and making sure our students can read and write and be able to become productive members of society. So I will be voting yes. Mrs. DeWitt, any? Nope, I voted once and I will stay the same. I will not be in support of this. Okay, anyone else? Call the roll, please. Hess. No. Smiltnik. Aye. Wright. Aye. Wyman. Uh, aye. Harlan. Aye. DeWitt. Nope. Herzog. Aye. Resolution carries. I'd also like to echo the kudos to the audience and those at home and those that were here and left. Everyone was very civil tonight and allowed us to have a discussion that was open and <laughs> had a lot of common sense and we really appreciate all of your thoughts and it really was a community effort and we appreciate all of that. Thank you. Uh, request for future agenda items. Any announcements? Dr. Herzog. Just one. Uh, the Wisconsin Association of School Boards is holding a series of workshops around the state for each of the 15 regions. Ours will be, our meeting will be held on uh, September 26th in Nina. Uh, good opportunity to network with board members from other districts and to learn more about Wisconsin's open meeting law and other legislative issues. Thank you. All right, is there a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second. Was that Carlin and Colin DeWitt? Carlin DeWitt. <laughs> Call the roll, please. All right, we have Smiltnik. Aye. Wright. Aye. Wyman. Aye. Carlin. Aye. DeWitt. Aye. Herzog. Aye. Hess. No. <laughs> no. You want to stay here longer, Tim, huh? Told you. Yeah. Motion carries, meeting is adjourned. <laughs>